Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Sunday service. During the month of August, whilst Jeff is on leave, we encourage you to join with us to watch the service provided by our PCI moderator, the Right Reverend Dr. David Bruce. And this will follow shortly. First of all, a couple of announcements. Should you require the support of a minister during August, cover is in place. For Strain, Bally Black, Carador and Bally Freenus, please do this by getting in touch with your clerk of session. Further details are on the relevant website or your Facebook page. The main car park at Strain has now reopened on a daily basis. Monday to Saturday from 9am and closing each day at 6pm. Then later this month on Thursday the 27th of August, we will be holding our monthly drop-in opportunity between 10am and 12 noon. Should you wish to donate foodstuffs, toiletries or cleaning products to the food bank, or indeed if you wish to drop off any of your church envelopes. And now in our birthday spot today, we want to wish, first of all, Joey Clint a very happy birthday. Joey was a big four during the week and we send our best wishes to him. And then for tomorrow, we wish a very happy birthday to Elma Kaki. So let's pray together. Father, we come before you this morning thankful for the beautiful weather this week. We give thanks that the sunshine and warmth has been so good for our farms, for our gardens and the countryside, and for those able to get out and about. We pray this morning for Joey as he celebrated his fourth birthday. Father, bless him in every step as he grows up and bless all in his family also. And we pray for Elma as she celebrates tomorrow with her family. This morning, Father, we think of all those affected by the terrible explosion in Beirut. We think of the multiple other crises in Lebanon, the overwhelming numbers of refugees, political upheaval, financial collapse, growing poverty and COVID-19. We pray for the work of PCI's mission department who are supporting emergency initiatives through partners in Lebanon, as well as the work of Christian Aid Ireland and Tear Fund in that land. Father, today we think about our young people in our congregations and our organisations who have or will receive a and AS and GCSE level grades over this couple of weeks. In the midst of uncertainty, we ask that you, our Heavenly Father, would reassure our young people that they are not defined by their grades and help them to understand that their greatest achievement is placing their trust in you, Lord. Father, this morning we pray for those affected by the derailment tragedy near Stonehaven in Scotland, for the families and friends of those who died, for colleagues that are grieving, for the emergency services and their courage and skill, and for those injured or traumatized. Dear Lord, we turn to you with our ongoing concerns about COVID-19. We pray that each and every member of our country would play their part in preventing the spread of this infection. We pray for those in positions of authority who have important decisions to make about how best to fight against this virus. And we pray for those working in our community who may by necessity be putting themselves at risk for those in health settings for teachers returning to school, and for the many shop and transport workers. Today, Lord, we pray for members of our congregation who are ill or in hospital, who are feeling lonely or isolated, 
who have been recently bereaved. We pray that we as a church might continue to reach out each day to those in our neighbourhood. Dear Father, as we bring all of these prayers to you, we continue to pray for our minister Jeff and Anne-Marie, for a much needed break and rest and for time to recharge the batteries. Father, we bring our prayers to you, knowing that you listen and asking for your grace and wisdom just where it is needed. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. And now we move across to the moderator's service. Welcome again to this service of worship for the Presbyterian Church in Ireland family. A great deal has been said in the last four months about the coronavirus crisis. And by necessity, a good proportion of that commentary has been a little speculative because we've never really had to deal with anything quite like this before. We're rightly grateful for the scientific analysis, uh, for the work on developing treatments for those who are ill, and of course a vaccine, just as we've been impressed and in awe of the selfless commitment of NHS and HSE staff on both sides of the border on this island. There have been few, if any, national emergencies which have prevented us from attending services of worship for extended periods of time. Few, if any, circumstances in history, with the possible exception of all-out war, which have required our governments to take such radical steps to protect the economy and the people. For us in the churches, we have had to reinvent our expectations of life of work, of worship, and of witness. But as we come to worship today, I wonder too if we're being asked to restate our expectations of God himself. Our expectations might be that God will fix this. But is he obliged to? And what if he doesn't, at least not on our terms? Will our faith in his fatherly care be the same? Our expectations might be that all will be well in the end, because our scientists will produce an effective vaccine and when we get access to it, a new normal will somehow kick in where we're all protected. We might expect that such a new normal won't be all that terribly different from the old ways we've always known. But what if it isn't? What if the new normal is that we continue to live with this virus in perpetuity into the future, mitigating the risks and reorganizing our lives to suit this new reality going forwards? That COVID becomes an enduring fact of life? Now, of course, I don't know what the future holds. I have no more insight into this than the next person. So my concern for us as a church is that in walking by faith rather than by sight, we as a people will be as ready as we can be for whatever happens, and that with God's help, we will be able to continue the journey. This morning, as we come to the close of chapter 2 of Ephesians, Paul says about the church that we are a people, we are a place where God is. In the midst of a crisis, this means that people who are seeking solace, seeking comfort, perhaps even seeking God himself, may well seek us out. Participating in the service today will be some members of the Armagh Presbytery. Peter Gamble is the clerk of Presbytery, and its moderator this year is Robin Brown. They will introduce the Presbytery, read and pray as we approach God. Welcome to the Armagh Presbytery, a presbytery that sweeps from Belleville on the southern shores of Loch Ness, through the towns of Lurgan and Portadown, across the orchard country, around Loch Gall and Rich Hill, down through Keedy to the border, 
even tiptoeing into the southeastern corner of County Tyrone at Caledon and the Moy. All this centered on the city of Armagh that I hope you can see behind me. Once home to great kings in Ireland and still today the ecclesiastical capital of this island with two cathedrals each named after Patrick who was active in this area now almost 16 centuries ago. As a presbytery with 29 congregations we are grateful to God that around half of these have seen significant growth over the last three decades. Others are holding their own. But there is concern that one or two are experiencing significant decline. And so we seek the help of the king and head of the church who made a promise that he would build, that he would be present with us, whether we are meeting at distance virtually or taking the first tentative steps to gathering once again within our church building. We trust our great God and King to be at work and to guide us and guard us for the days ahead that we seek to serve him in this place. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. And blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. And blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord blessed be your name, you give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Let's unite our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God and loving Heavenly Father, we pause in your presence, seeking to hear from you, to learn of you and to live like you. 
we come to the one who is maker of heaven and earth and yet who is eager to be intimately involved in our lives. We praise you that you've loved us so much that you've sent your son Jesus Christ into this world to save us, to claim us as your own. Lord, we recognise the unworthiness of our lives and hearts, that we sin, we fall, we fail, we mess up, we get it wrong. But still you reach out to us in redeeming love, to lift us back onto your feet, to set us in paths of righteousness and to lead us in the way. So Lord, may our eyes be fixed upon you, individually and corporately as your people. And may we know that you are alive and at work in our midst in ways beyond our knowing, but ever to your glory and for our good. Lord, bless your church. Bless your people. At whatever cost, we ask that you would shape and mold us to be more like Jesus. So work in our hearts, we pray. In his name. Amen. This is God's word. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. We give thanks for God's word. National calamity is not unknown in the Bible. I think of the devastation brought about upon the life of the people of God in their 70 years of exile in Babylon. Yes, that's 70 years, not 70 days, 70 weeks or 70 months. And they didn't have a new normal to look forward to, at least not with any degree of confidence. Their history would be shaped by this before and after event. Before the exile, they were a people largely shaped by one defining moment in their history, along with one iconic physical symbol of this, which tied their memories together. Before the exile, the moment in history which defined them, the memory to which they constantly referred back in time, was their exodus from slavery in Egypt under Moses' leadership and how God delivered the people from their oppression in that land, giving them a different land, a new land to settle, which they could call their own, and a national identity among all the other nations round about. The physical symbol joined to this great memory of God's past deliverance and enduring presence with them was, of course, the temple, which had been built in Jerusalem. When they arrived in the land of promise after their 40 years of wandering in the desert, the people were no longer a nomadic and enslaved and oppressed tribe, but now a settled nation with a home of their own. The great symbol of this was Zion, the city of God, and of course the centerpiece of Zion was the temple, the place where, which defined their worship and which uh, indicated where their identity lay. This was the place of their pilgrimage. This was the focus of their festivals. This was the picture of their past and their hope for the future. For the temple above everything else was the place where God is. We really cannot overstate how important the temple was to the Hebrew people or how devastating it then was to them to have it all taken away, because taken away it was in a moment of collective catastrophe. The all-powerful Babylonian Empire invaded, and in the year 587 BC, many of the people were shipped away and the city of Jerusalem, 
its walls, its royal palace, and yes, its temple, were razed to the ground. No more Jerusalem, no more Zion, no more kings, no more temple, and a God who had apparently gone strangely silent. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept, said the people. How could we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? And so it would be for these years, most of these original exiles long dead by the time things would change again. Would there be a new normal for them? Would their faith survive this complete upheaval of everything they had known? Would permission be given for them to go back to their buildings and sing again? Well, the answer, of course, is yes, but not in the way that most of them expected. After these years of exile, they did indeed return to the land. But now there would be not one defining moment in history to look back upon, the exodus, but two defining moments, the exodus and the exile. Their collective memory as a people had changed. Through these events, their story had been completely rewritten from one end of the scroll right the way through to the other. And what of that iconic physical symbol of the temple? Well, it lay in ruins along with the city itself. So what was God doing? To answer that, it's very important for us to notice what happened next. There were those, of course, who said, in the light of the exile and like Nehemiah, we need to rebuild. We need to get the walls of the city up again. We need to get the plans ready to rebuild the temple in Zion. Our new normal, according to this particular vision, is a reworked version of the old normal. And our task is to conserve what remains and rebuild what has been destroyed. Now, there's nothing wrong with that vision, and indeed it gained traction and was ultimately achieved, well, at least for a time. But alongside this, and pouring into the vacuum which was created by these devastating events of the exile, a new and unstoppable thing began to happen. It pushed Judaism out of Zion. It dispersed Judaism to every nation in the known world. And this dispersal, this pushing out, created a brand new concept within Judaism. It was a concept which they called the synagogue, localized gatherings of Hebrew believers in all the major population centers of the world, its ports, its cities, its towns, throughout the Persian and then the Greek and finally the Roman empires, all of them had their synagogues. After the exile, after this disruption, Judaism was, at least in practical terms, never again solely a religion of Zion or the Jerusalem temple. And what did God do with this new normal? Well, of course you know and it's why we are here. This very same network of synagogues became the nodal system through which the gospel was then taken by Paul and the early church through Asia Minor to Europe and ultimately beyond. And it was this which gave Paul permission to write as he does in the passage that's before us in Ephesians today. As we come to see how he understood it, we listen to this song challenging us as a people of faith to rise up and express our hope for the future, even though the times are uncertain. Men of faith, rise up and sing. Men of faith, rise up and sing of the great and glorious King. You are strong Brokenness complete. Shout to the north and the south, saying to the east and the west, Jesus, the Savior to all, Lord of heaven and earth. 
Eyes of women off the truth Stand and sing to broken hearts Who can know the healing power All for us, King of Love Shout to the north and the south Sing to the east and the west Jesus, Savior to all Lord of heaven and earth We've been through fire, we've been through rain We've been refined by the power of His name We've fallen deeper in love with you We've burned the truth on our lips Shout to the north and the south Sing to the east and the west Jesus Savior to all, Lord of heaven and earth. Rise up, church, with broken wings. Fill this place with songs again. Of our God reigns on high. By His grace again we'll fly. Shout to the north and the south. Sing to the east and the west Jesus is Savior to all Lord of heaven and earth Lord of heaven and earth Lord of heaven and earth In these few verses Paul draws together much of what he has taught so far in this letter. He writes, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Consequently, of course, refers back to everything he has said so far. Those who were far away, without hope and without God in the world, have been brought near in Christ. And this applies to both Jews and to Gentiles who now find themselves not the members of a new religion but models of a new humanity. In Christ, Jews and Gentiles reconciled to each other despite their past enmities and reconciled vertically to God despite their past sins. Peace is preached. So he says, please understand that this is not mere theological theorizing, but practical, gritty, lived experience for you who together are to be members of the same household. Then in verse 20, a new picture is introduced, or at least a repainting of a very old picture indeed. My wife Zoe and I are having some work done on our house and the builders arrived on Monday of this week to dig some foundations for a small extension we're having put up. Now the foundations for this little building are deep and when the concrete was poured in and ultimately the blocks are laid on top of the concrete, it will be immovable and secure, or at least we hope it will be, otherwise the building won't endure. The foundation for this new humanity of which Paul writes, the Christian church, is to be the teaching of the apostles and prophets. Now, apostles were those who were personal witnesses to the resurrected Jesus and who taught of his life, having known it at first hand themselves. The prophets in this New Testament sense were those who were gifted with the specific ability to teach the significance of what the apostles explained had happened. Now, For us today, the foundational teaching of the church is therefore the written record of this which we retain in Scripture. Now there's a great deal of talk about this these days because Scripture is often challenging when we read it. Not so much because it's difficult to understand, its message is plain enough, but because it often resists popular culture and popular opinion. 
But we nonetheless insist that the foundation of the church remains as it has been and as Paul describes it, the teaching of the New Testament apostles and prophets. And we as a people therefore commit ourselves to the best academic research into these texts, to diligent study of them and careful examination of every detail as we apply them to our lives. It was, I think, the author G.K. Chesterton who famously said, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. Scripture can be a challenging book because of its content. Consistent with these foundations is the cornerstone of the structure, who is Jesus himself. And the cornerstone ties together the courses of materials which will make up the wall. The cornerstone permits the building to be joined together consistently so that it can rise to completion. The building is not constructed randomly, even though the materials may be diverse in size and in colour and in shape. The cornerstone sets the course for it all, just as Jesus Christ sets the course for the church. And what is it all for, this church, which is likened to a physical building? Well, it is in verses 21 and 22, to be a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Now look carefully at this. In him, you two are being built together. Paul the Jew, is saying to his Gentile readers, be in no doubt about this at all. This applies to you Gentiles. That old wall of hostility in the Jerusalem temple prevented you Gentiles from even taking a walk within the precincts of the complex of the temple. But now, in Christ, you are not only permitted to enter the temple, but you have become part of the temple. The temple is not just open to you, you are the temple. And you see also what this means for the covenant, the old promise which was made by God to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and repeated like a refrain right the way through the Bible, that he would be their God and they would be his people. Now, with this extraordinary restating of the vision of where God is to be found, Paul allows one of his fellow apostles, John, to reflect upon this and write in Revelation 21 verses 2 and 3 that he saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place, that is God's home, is now among the people. And he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. The church is far more important than we know. She is the dwelling place of God. She is his temple. The temple of God rises at the start of the day and puts on the kettle to make a cup of tea. The temple of God sits on the bus and goes to work. The temple of God socially distances and wears a mask to the shops. The temple of God comes home for dinner at six. The temple of God beats with a heart of flesh and blood and walks our streets and lives in our homes and speaks all kinds of languages and believes all manner of politics and offers allegiance to all kinds of flags. And the temple of God throws open her doors to say to outsiders, here is good news. The temple of God will not be undermined. The temple of God will not be shaken. The temple of God will not fall, come what may for her foundations are sound and her cornerstone is God himself in Christ. But oh, how careful we must be if we are those charged for a time of being her stewards, 
that we do not abuse her or sully her reputation by our foolishness or trade her testimony for our popularity or offer her as a sacrifice on the altar of political expediency. The church is far more important than we know. The church is the place where God is. As we respond to God's word today, listen to this song about the cornerstone of the building, after which Joanne Smith, who is the minister of Caledon and Minterburn Presbyterian churches in the Armagh Presbytery, will lead us in prayer for others. Father, we are thankful to be gathered together to worship you. 
We're thankful that even at a time of distance and separation, Christ is always the cornerstone. And it is always in him that we, his church, find our hope and our identity. Knowing this, that we are the church, that you dwell within us through your spirit. Lord, knowing this, we can come to you with so much confidence and ask you for the things we need. And we do that now, Lord. We pray for those we know who are ill, who are in hospital, who are trying to find answers, who are waiting for treatment, who are recovering from treatment. We pray for those who are worried, who are anxious, who are depressed, for the many different things that life throws at us, problems with money and with work, with relationships and with families. Lord, we, we take a moment now and just quietly bring these needs to you. And our Heavenly Father, at this point in the summer, we do pray for all the complexity of going back to school this year. Lord, we pray for everyone who got results this past week. Uh, it can be such a confusing time, no matter what the grades. Uh, Lord, help our young people who received results to, to turn to you and to remember that all of their hope and their security is to be found in you that planning and preparation and, and dreaming about the future is good, but ultimately you are the rock that gives us the firm foundation that our hearts long for. And so Lord, we pray for everyone going back to school, students and teachers and, and everyone else. Lord, we ask for your help, for your wisdom and your courage as everyone tries to navigate what this new school term will look like. Lord, we ask you keep our schools safe, that going back to, to school will not in any way impact or lead to any second wave. And Lord, we bring our children and young people before you. So many of them have struggled with this time off, as have their parents. Lord, help all of them to deal with their, their nerves and this big change that's about to happen. And something that's normally so routine is causing so much apprehension. And so, Lord, we ask for your help uh, for everyone involved in getting back to school in September. And Lord, thinking of that, we ask for your help for our government, Lord, for your continued guidance. They have so many hard decisions to make on a daily basis. Lord, help them as they try to provide leadership across our country. And Heavenly Father, thinking further afield, we pray for the people of Lebanon. Lord, this explosion has exposed so much of the chaos and the suffering already present. And so, Lord, we ask now that you help us to be faithful in prayer. And Lord, we pray for the people of Lebanon, that you would give them the care and the courage they need. We pray for the leadership in Lebanon, that you would bring order into disorder and we pray for the many Christian organisations in Lebanon, especially for PCI's partner organisations, that you would help them in their ongoing mission to strengthen the Christians in Lebanon and to reach out to those who do not yet know you with the glorious and powerful life-changing message of the gospel. Lord, help all these organisations in their work and guide them as they think about how to serve you in the current situation. Lord, we bring all our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you to all who have participated in the service from the Armagh Presbytery today, and of course to you for joining with us. Next week we'll explore how this church of which we're part is a church with a message. We will be joined by some members of the Down Presbytery. But now, let me pray for you. May grace and mercy and peace from Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen.